the fourth chapter. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under the shade waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head and save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? The word of the Lord. I remember a particular episode of a show called Mad Men about an advertising executive in New York in the 1960s. In this particular episode, the advertising firm was going to sit down with a Japanese company that wanted to use their advertising services. And one of the men, Roger Sterling, was very upset that his firm would ever agree to do business with the Japanese. You see, he had fought in World War II and he still saw the Japanese as enemies. He acted so impolitely in his meeting that his colleagues dragged him out of the room and flat out told him he had to get over it. The Japanese were not their enemies anymore. Times had changed. Our nation over time has viewed different countries or groups of people with fear and suspicion. Maybe it was the Russians or Korea and now the countries of Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq seem to be in the news and have been for over a decade. And internally, within our own country, we will view certain people with suspicion and fear. You might hear nasty sentiments on the news or online about immigrants, refugees from other countries, African Americans, even people who just see the world differently from how we do or people of other faiths, such as Muslims or Sikhs and even atheists. And we may feel like we have really good reasons to dislike or suspect a group of people. Maybe we personally had a negative experience or two. Maybe we believe a particular group of people is destroying faith or family values or the way things should be. And so in the name of religion or family values or patriotism, we learn to condemn and even to hate. And we usually feel pretty justified in our opinions. Enter the story of Jonah. Jonah lived in 700s BCE. In the very back of your bulletin, I provide a little timeline of about where he falls in line, as well as sort of a map. It didn't come out terribly clear, but you can get an idea of these cities we talk about in the story. At that time, the Assyrian Empire was a threat to the northern king of Israel, where Jonah lived. Jonah may have personally seen violence and death that resulted from their menacing presence. The Assyrians were the enemy, and the capital city of Assyria was Nineveh. In addition to all of this, the Old Testament, for most of the Old Testament, was a time in human history when everybody still believed in tribal gods. The Jews had their god, the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they also believed that other tribes 
had their gods. And when a war happened, everybody prayed to their gods for protection and may the strongest god win, so to speak. You see this with the sailors in chapter 1 who all start to pray to their god, hoping one of them will answer and still the storm. The idea of a universal god, a singular god who cares about everyone on the planet was not a common theme in Jonah's time. Yes, the Old Testament has references and hints all throughout it, and even prophets talked about a universal God here and there, but honestly, the common people didn't quite get it. Even when Jesus was doing his ministry, when he'd pay attention to non-Jews, it made no sense to the Jews. And when Christianity started out among the Gentiles, the non-Jews, it was a mind-blowing revelation. So Jonah would have grown up believing that God belonged to him, to the Jews, and that God only cared about the Jewish people, and that God's job was to help them fight against their enemies. Now you'd think that the particular message God gives Jonah to preach actually sounds pretty good. Jonah's supposed to go to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, their enemies, and tell them that in 40 days God's going to destroy them. Sounds like a really good message that he might want to preach. Except that Jonah realized that behind this odd request from God was something far more significant, something he didn't want to look at. To warn the Ninevites, was to open the door for an opportunity, the chance to repent. And if they repented, Jonah knew what kind of God he was dealing with. Merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Darn it. So the story is not about a whale or a fish that swallowed Jonah. It isn't about whether we believe Nineveh was really a three days walk across or not. If we focus and argue about those little details, we miss the whole point of the story. And the point is that God is giving the enemies a chance to repent and to be forgiven. That God actually cared about the Israelites' enemies. Namely, that means God is the God of all people, not just the God of the Jews. Let's pause here, because honestly we still get tripped up by this. Even though the Old Testament lifts up non-Jews for their faith, such as Ruth and Rahab, other men and women, and even though Isaiah paints a picture where one day all the nations will come to the mountain of God, streaming forth to God, and even though Jesus spoke to the Romans and Samaritans and found faith in them, and even though in John 3.16, the most quoted verse in the entire Bible Jesus says that God loves the entire cosmos, people, animals, plants, enough to send his son. Sometimes we still like to claim God as if God is ours alone. Now there's nothing wrong with saying God bless America as long as we realize that God cares for every single country on this planet. God cares for every man, woman, and child on this planet exactly the same. What Jonah didn't understand was that just because he was of the chosen people didn't mean that God didn't care about anyone else. It simply meant that as the chosen people, they were given more responsibility. They had a job to do. And as Christians, we have been given the responsibility to be the body of Christ here on earth, and then to do what Jesus did, which was speaking to those that everybody else judged unworthy, feeding the hungry, curing the sick, including the excluded, and pointing out hypocrisy, power, and privilege among the religious elite. Actually, it's a very difficult job description to live up to. The book of Jonah is meant to be dramatic and over the top to prove a point. When Jonah offers this 40-day window before destruction, he is unwillingly inviting the people to repent. Because what do we remember about the number 40 in the Bible? 
It was 40 days that Jonah was in the ark where the rain came down. Did I say Jonah was in the ark? It would be Noah. <laughs> that would be Noah and his family. It was 40 years that the Israelites wandered around in the wilderness. And it was 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted. Because that 40 days is significant. It means something. 40 is a time of difficulty, a time of repentance and fasting, a time of learning and changing, of trouble before new life. And that is why our Lent, our season of Lent before Easter, is 40 days long. Jonah knows that couched in that message of destruction was a wide open window for repentance. The people of Nineveh inexplicably take the opportunity and go for it in a big way. And Jonah is angry. He wants to see his enemies destroyed. And this is where God decides to teach Jonah a lesson. God gives Jonah a bush for shade and one day later kills it with the help of a little worm. Jonah is so upset about the bush he throws a toddler-sized temper tantrum and then God questions him. Why is it that you care more about a bush which you didn't create or work for than you do about thousands of men, women, children, and animals? Seriously, what is wrong with you? And we never hear the answer. That is where the story ends. We never hear if Jonah leaves pouting and muttering or if he had an epiphany and a change of heart. Because the author of the book turns the question right over to us. We are Jonah. We have enemies whether we want to admit it or not. People we speak nasty things about. People we want to see punished. We want even destroyed. And wrapped up in our own little worlds day in and day out, sometimes we might make a bigger fuss about our cell phone dying or breaking a favorite dish than we do about reports of the death and bombings of people in the world especially if it happens to them. We are Jonah. We have forgotten the truth that God loves every single person on this planet and the animals and plants too. And that if we consider ourselves a person of faith, we are to care too. We are to love what God loves. And to remember that God wants redemption over destruction, mercy over damnation, every single time. Jesus even teaches us to pray for our enemies and not in a condescending way, but in a way that genuinely hopes good for them, that wishes for their spiritual and mental well-being. That 21-year-old a couple weeks ago that went into an African-American church and shot eight African-Americans, he acted as their enemy and yet the church responded with forgiveness. Of course they were devastated by what he did, and of course it didn't mean that what he did was okay, but they recognized that inside he is a damaged human being, because only someone who's severely damaged could do something that awful. What he needed, what he needs, is healing. Martin Luther King Jr. understood this as well when he was leading the civil rights movement. People would respond to him and the people he was leading with such hatred and violence and nastiness that his people were attempted to strike back. It was hard not to. But over and over again, he preached sermons telling them to pray for their enemies, to match hatred with love, to bring light into darkness. Because you cannot fight darkness with darkness, only with light. And you cannot fight hatred with hatred, only love. Maybe this sounds naive to you or impossible, so let me leave you with two thoughts. First, our human history is littered with hatred fighting hatred, leaving death and destruction in its wake, solving very little. Yet we are convinced it just might work the next time. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting this different result is the definition of insanity. Secondly, to take the Bible seriously, 
does not mean arguing about whether it was a whale or a fish in Jonah. Taking the Bible seriously means listening to the message of the book and recognizing that we are Jonah and that God is calling us to see the world differently and to behave differently. That being a Christian is actually really hard because we're tempted to feel superior and to claim God is ours and ours alone. Instead of embodying through word and deed the love and grace that God feels for all people, showing light and love and mercy in a world of darkness, violence, and destruction. We may be people of faith, as Jonah was, but the book of Jonah asks, faith in what? What do you really believe? What kind of God do you really worship? Amen.